Yep. So for the last 40 years, every child in America that's in any way involved with any kind of public school and many children, especially children of the lowest income families, are the predominant amount of their food comes from school lunch, school breakfast, from the WIC program, women, infants, and children, and from food stamps or the SNAP benefits, right? All of these follow the dietary guidelines. And so Nina just said for the last 45 years, this has been going on. Now, 45 years ago, guess what there was no such thing as? Type two diabetes in children. There was also no such thing as dietary induced fatty liver in children. Those things didn't exist. The rate of obesity in children was very close to zero. It was about 1% when I was in kindergarten. So the, while the federal government's dietary guidelines have been in effect for the last 40, 45 years, all of these new pediatric conditions have come out of nowhere. And some people are saying this is genetic. Some people are saying we don't know why this is happening. All the while, it's directly related to the food that these children have been eating, the very food that's been recommended by the federal government's dietary guidelines. Now, if you're new to the food wars, if you're just joining us, you might say, well, why would big pharma want to fund uh, big food? Because big food's going to make all the money from that, selling the ultra processed, high carb, sugar added crap. Well, Yes, big food does profit on the front end of that. But then after a few years of eating that, that child now has type 2 diabetes or fatty liver or is obese. Now big pharma is happy to step in and say, you know, we've got a pill for that or we've got an injection for that or an infusion. So big food and big pharma are making out like bandits to the tune of multi-billions of dollars in profit while the American children, young adults, are suffering from chronic diseases that are completely avoidable, completely preventable, and completely reversible. But in order to do that, you have to know about real human food. So uh, if you haven't already done this, I guarantee you this affects your life, whether you know it or not. Please click the share button down at the bottom of the screen. Share this all over your social media because the more people just like you, that understand this problem and understand just what a huge problem this is, the quicker that Nina and I and everybody in this current administration, whether you like them or not, whether you like Trump or not, it's irrelevant. Whether you like RFK Jr. or not, that's irrelevant. We're talking about the health of, of our current children and the health of every future child born into America or anywhere that the American uh, influence goes around the world. Please share this video. So, Nina, I know you've been involved for years in this fight, trying to get the dietary guidelines changed. Do you do you feel like that you see a ray of sunshine now with this with the current administration, the current atmosphere in D.C.? Yeah, are we are we liable to make some progress this go round? Yeah. You know, you make a really important point that this is not a partisan issue. We, you know, obesity, diabetes, the $1 trillion a day that we are spending on our health care due to these well, 85, 90% of that is goes to treating and managing chronic diseases. This is a, this is not a right or left issue. It really is an issue that affects everybody. Our military, the, a third of all recruits cannot are not qualified, mainly due to obesity and also and being on medications. So we have we have a national pro problem. This administration has elevated the issue of chronic disease. It's something that's long overdue, and I'm grateful to them for that. But we have and this is an opportunity, and I do see a ray of light in these guidelines um, in that, as I said, first of all, I think that they are re-examining the cap on saturated fats. Why is that so important? Saturated fats, the cap on those, which really dates back to like the early 1960s with the American Heart Association that started that, that limits the amount of uh, red meat that people are allowed to eat and meat with fat in it. You know, you need the fat in order to process the protein. You need the fat for satiety. So the, the cap on saturated fat limits the amount of real regular meat that people can eat and also whole milk. 
You cannot have whole milk in the schools. I mean, we have only uh, non non-fat milk or one percent milk is allowed. You cannot even give away whole milk for free on any in any public school. And eggs, you can't get more than three eggs a week served for breakfast. So these are whole nutrient dense foods that are uh, are severely limited in the meal programs or any program that is following the guidelines due to the cap on saturated fats. Um, those foods are also the foods that contain all the essential nutrients that we need in order to survive. They're not optional nutrients, they're essential nutrients in the form that humans can absorb them. So for instance, you cannot absorb the iron that is in spinach. Uh, that is not well absorbed. Humans absorb heme iron. Heme iron is available in animal foods and principally red meat. So that's just one example. You can't get calcium well absorbed from vegetables. It's much better absorbed from dairy products. So we need these foods. They're also the source of complete proteins, meaning they have all the nine essential fatty acids that you need to eat and consume in a single sitting in order to generate uh, protein for your body, which is has a huge range of um, functions in your body. It's not just your muscle, muscles, it's your immune system, your ability to resist infections. So that, so lifting the cap on saturated fats, um, which is justified by the science, 100%, I, I think, um, we can talk about that, but that would be a huge and dramatic shift. Um, I think there's there's also talk, although not none of this is for sure, but I can just tell you the conversations that I hear uh, about reducing the amount of sugar that's allowed down from 10% of calories. We should not have 10% of calories coming from a food that is not just empty calories, but actively drives insulin resistance and chronic disease. Agreed. There's converse, conversation about reducing the amount of added sugars and grains, reducing refined grains. I mean, why are we recommending three servings of refined grains a day? That should not be uh, part of the guidelines. I mean, just an anecdote, I can tell you, I've looked at the, the, the USDA approved um, items that go to schools and to um, other institutions. I mean, there's literally individually sized uh, Fruit Loops and Lucky Charms and Dora the Explorer cereal and lots of individually sized fruit juices, which is just sugar water. So those foods should not be allowed. They should not be elevated in any way or condoned by our guidelines. So I, I, I know that there are discussions about that. And the really important discussion that I want to share with your um, audience is the that there is a consideration of including some language that allows for a low carbohydrate diet for people with metabolic diseases. This is this is the potential language that I hope people can maybe get loud about because it's so important that that be an option. And <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of a broader perspective, when the guidelines were launched in 1980, as Ken said, um, Dr. Barry said obesity was the rates of obesity were very low for adults. They were below 12 percent uh, obesity rates. Type 2 diabetes also low, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease also very low. So the population was generally healthy and they created a guidelines to prevent disease yep. in a generally healthy population. Yes, By and let me, let me interject, Nina, you're exactly yeah. right. So this is actually in the, the federal government's uh, code, Title Seven, Section 5341. It says, quote, to promote health and reduce the risk of chronic disease through improved nutrition and physical activity. And then it also says that this, this shall be shall be intended for the general public. Right. But now we have a general public, 88% of them have at least one marker of metabolic dysfunction or metabolic disease. And so I think what you're saying, even if they just put in a caveat 
oh, if you have diabetes or obesity or fatty liver or hypertension or metabolic syndrome, then you should consider a lower carbohydrate diet. Even that would be a huge victory. Is that what is that what you think the, the compromise will wind up being? Or do you think we can hope for even more than that? I, I think that would be enough. Just a sentence or two that for people with metabolic diseases, for people with obesity, type 2 diabetes, they should consider a low carbohydrate diet uh, based because, because it is an evidence based option. And by that, I mean it is supported by controlled clinical trials showing that these diseases can not just be prevented but reversed with a low or very low carbohydrate diet. I think that, I think without that language, the guidelines will not be complying with this law that you just cited, which is that they must be for the general public. The general public is sick. The yep. general public is no longer healthy. We have most, the vast majority of American adults have one or more chronic disease and the guidelines must serve that general public. So, I, I'm, I know that, that it is a consideration and it is being discussed uh, at the highest levels, but we really have to push for it because I think anybody who's been in this space for any amount of time will recognize that there is a tremendous amount of bias against this nutritional approach. It's, it's been, uh, it's radically different than the low fat status quo. It is has a reputation due to a lot of bad media and press as being somehow unsafe or dangerous or a fad. I mean, nothing could be farther from the truth, but there's a lot of resistance to a nutritional approach that actually gets people healthy. It's a threat to the junk food industry. It's a threat to the pharmaceutical industry who part of their business model is managing chronic diseases with pills and injections and getting people healthy with food will undermine that business model. So we have to push for this. We have to know that there are a lot of stakeholders in Washington, everything from the crop farmers to the pharmaceutical industry to Kellogg's and General Mills, who will be pushing back hard on this language. And again, I just want to emphasize for people around the world, if the U.S. government says the low carbohydrate diet is one safe and effective option, just an option, not for everyone, that changes the landscape for the whole world. It's sort of like letting the genie out of the bottle um, and saying having a, a, a high level authority say this is really a viable and important option for people with these diseases. 